Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, it's John King over there. I'm Peter Christian. Hey, and good morning. Nine o'clock. We'll be joined by Dirk Sandifer, who's running for Supreme Court. Yes, he's uh, chilling out in the corner in here while we talk about politics because he's a nonpartisan candidate. He's not saying anything. We're not going to throw him into this. <laughs> but Peter and I are completely partisan. Oh my gosh! And uh, I, I, I'm sure you all have your opinions too, and we want to hear them at seven two one twelve ninety. Tell us what you thought about the big debate. Now, Peter. Had a strong opinion. I, we talked about it a little bit earlier. What I was did. your takeaway well, after well, the... Well, I had I had a special strategy in watching the debate, okay? <laughs> First of all, my wife and I have already voted. We got our absentee ballots. We've already voted. It's our Senate. And so a lot of this stuff I'm going, la, 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 you know, because <laughs> we already made up our minds. However, my strategy was this, okay? I did not want to watch the whole debate. So what I did was, is I watched the, uh, I, I watched the, uh, the Cubs you know, dismantled the Dodgers, and I also watched the end of the game where Cleveland beat uh, beat Toronto. So Cleveland's in the World Series. So the two teams I wanted to win had uh, won last night, so I was in a good mood. So I would switch back and forth, you know, in between innings and commercials and stuff and watch the debate. And and the snippets that I heard, uh, it, it just looked to me like Hillary Clinton was making Donald Trump look like a clown uh, with, with many of the things that... That, that he was talking about it. And, and that was the mood that I gathered from, I didn't watch the whole thing from beginning to end. So, but what, what I did listen to, it, it, Trump did not look good. And my wife, who watched the whole thing, uh, was saying, oh, Peter, oh, my, I, I think poor, poor Mr. Trump is doomed, you know? Well, I, I think that's true. Um, and <laughs> as far as looking like a clown, I think Trump does most of that on his own. Uh, but uh, the uh, debate, I, I think that most people walked away from that, at least from what I've seen, giving Trump the edge. Really? Now, not the journalists and stuff, but they do these focus groups, well, right? Yeah, yeah. So Luntz had his focus group. There was a narrow margin of victory for Trump over Clinton and the Luntz focus group. Why? And the <laughs> CNN had their own focus group. It was 10 to 5. Really? Uh, in favor of Trump. So there's obviously there was a lot of, of, of stuff that people kind of jived with that Trump was saying. Um, I, as far as the, the highlights of the debate, you know, you, you go to sleep, you wake up the next morning, what are the one or two sound bites you're going to remember? Um, <clears throat> by far, the most, thing, most commonly tweeted thing has to do with Trump uh, slamming Hillary as "quote unquote" nasty. Right. Uh, why don't you go ahead and play that clip real quick? Okay. All right. Here we go. So, ladies and gentlemen, from the debate last night, Donald Trump. I am on record as saying that we need to put more money into the Social Security Trust Fund. That's part of uh, my commitment to raise taxes on the wealthy. My Social Security payroll contribution will go up, as will Donald's, assuming he can't figure out how to get out of it. Uh, but what we want to do is to replenish the Social Such a Security nasty Trust woman. Fund by making <laughs> sure that we have sufficient resources. And that will come from either raising the cap and or finding other ways to get more money into it. I will not cut benefits. I want to enhance benefits for low-income workers and for women who have been disadvantaged by the current Social Security system. Now, for a lot of people, they're like, why are people so upset? It's obvious that Hillary is nasty and a woman. What's the problem? <laughs> and then for uh, the other half of Americans, they're like, oh, you know, that was the worst thing you could ever say to a woman on a stage. I can't believe it's so demeaning. Um, but more than that, this is by far the most popular cut from the night. This is the the thing that apparently everyone forgot about the Bush Gore, right? Uh, you know, uh, the election that you, you mean the hanging, session, the hanging, the hanging Chad? chads, the, the Florida. <laughs> no, no uh, you may not competence. I don't know what people, you want to call it. A lot of people may not realize this, but the former governor of Montana, Mark Roscoe, mm -hmm. played in integral role in in the bush administration or what it, it, you know he, he he was the one that went down there to help ramrod the counting of the votes he was in charge of many of the aspects of that investigation and uh evidently did a fairly good job because bush won so <laughs> what do you mean good job uh, hopefully you do a good job because the outcome is what well, the people wanted well, and well, that's you, how they you, voted you, right? you know what i mean i mean he did a good he did a good job for what he was asked to do well, so, I, yeah, yeah, and and actually, they went back and they've they've ran the numbers on those votes and ballots right. over and over, and and it, it ended up that Bush did actually win. But exactly. uh, go ahead and play this clip. Okay, th th this is Donald Trump talking about whether or not he would accept 
the final decision of the voters after the election was over. There is a tradition in this country, in fact, one of the prides of this country, is the peaceful transition of power and that no matter how hard fought a campaign is, that at the end of the campaign, that the loser concedes to the winner, not saying that you're necessarily going to be the loser or the winner, but that the loser concedes to the winner and that the country comes together in part for the good of the country. Are you saying you're not prepared now to commit to that principle? What I'm saying is that I will tell you at the time. I'll keep you in suspense. Well, okay? Chris, let me respond to that because that's horrifying. <laughs> you know, every time Donald thinks things are not going in his direction, he claims whatever it is is rigged against him. Uh, the FBI conducted a year-long investigation into my emails. They concluded there was no case. He said the FBI was rigged. He lost the Iowa caucus. He lost the Wisconsin primary. He said the Republican primary was rigged against him. Then Trump University gets sued for fraud and racketeering. He claims the court system and the federal judge is rigged against him. Uh, there was even a time when he didn't get an Emmy for his TV program three years in a row, and he started tweeting that the Emmys were rigged against Should have gotten it. This, this is a mindset. This is, this is how Donald thinks. And it's funny, also really troubling. Okay. Now, that is not the way our democracy works. We've been around for 240 years. We've had free and fair elections. We've accepted the outcomes when we may not have liked them. Uh -huh. And that is what must be expected of anyone standing on a debate stage during a general election. You know, President Obama said the other day, when you're whining before hold, hold, the game hold on, is folks. even hold on, finished, folks. it just shows you, you're not up to doing the job. And let's, you know, let's be clear about what he is saying and what that means. He is denigrating, he's talking down our democracy. And I, for one, am appalled that somebody who is the nominee of one of our two major parties would take that kind of position. I think what the FBI did and what the Department of Justice did, including meeting with her husband, the attorney general, on the back of an airplane on the tarmac in Arizona, I think it's disgraceful. I think it's a disgrace. All right. I think we've never had a situation uh, uh, hold, so bad. Okay. There so, you go. So, so what do you folks think? Folks are already on the line to talk about this, so let's get right to it. Uh, evidently, they, Hillary has such a short memory. I mean, it was just a few years ago when the entire nation was in a turmoil over the outcome of the presidential election. Exactly. I mean, to so. say that this has never <laughs> happened before in the history I'm shocked. of America. I'm absolutely horrified and that, that this would have happened. Was, was it really my <laughs> husband's running mate? I can't. What? what? <laughs> Yeah, it's, okay. it's a little silly. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the invectives over the top. All right, let's get Marilyn on first. Hey, Marilyn, thanks for holding. What's up? Okay, many things. Um, first of all, okay, to the vote thing, I mean, that Project Veritas has plenty of tape out there that says these Democrats have been committing voter fraud for 50 years. Well, that's rigged, you know. No, it's, yeah, it's rigged by them. Yeah, and I think Donald Trump did the right thing by saying he would wait until he sees at the very end. He'll fight, try and find out how much voter fraud is coming in from all of the country. Because um, there's on these tapes, there's talk about this uh, this Mexican guy that's involved with getting illegals signed up to register. Now, I actually there's, do have about two or so minutes of those tapes if you want me to play them, Marilyn. Well, I mean, there's so much. Yeah, let me really quick before I. I mean, there's so much. And one guy says that we're going to win this M effort if we have to, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. I've got stuff written down here yeah. on my notes, but I can't. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. another thing she said when she was talking about the Heller case, that was a big fat lie. It had nothing to do with toddlers. It had everything to do with our vi our individual right to have a handgun. So she lied about that. She she wants to, her and Obama, there's tape out there about them, want to be like Australia, want to have gun confiscation, gun sale back, whatever, disarm the people like Australia. Um, another thing, the fact that she keeps going on about how she's for the children, for the children, for the children, for the children. She uses and exploits children whenever she has to, and yet she's the woman that is, the blood on her hands of 65 million babies, she can't deny that. She's all for that. She pushes it every time she practically opens her mouth. 
she's disgusting. All right, Marilyn, we're way past a break, okay. so we got we got to go. Thanks. Appreciate the call. We're going to get Dave on, and we're going to get Mike on, and we have two other lines open. Seven two one twelve ninety. We're coming right back. Talk back, roll, and ride along. Seven two one twelve ninety. We went a little long in that segment. It was my fault. Uh, so we'll have about three minutes or four minutes before we have to take another break. So go ahead. We got full lines. Or we do pretty close to it. So let's, let's run let's it through. Let's jump some more right calls. in here this morning and say good morning to Dave. Dave, you're on Talk Back. Hi. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to speak to two other lies I heard. Okay. Why number one that Donald Trump didn't know any of the women. Now that's a, a, definitely a bald faced lie. He did know some of the women. Uh, and no, are about, you talking no in the biblical sense? Or? <laughs> no. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I had to say it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Carnal <laughs> knowledge, Peter. Carnal knowledge. Sorry. One of them was a contestant on his show. He knew her. Okay. And he said he didn't know any of the women. So that's a lie. Okay. Uh, lie number two about ISIS. Um, ISIS, the blame goes to Maliki. Period. Um, and I can tell you the whole story if you want me to tell you. It, it all started with um, George W. Bush and Maliki meeting and, and uh, agreeing to uh, withdraw troops from, from Iraq. It is a little bit more complicated than that. Right. Uh, yeah, Maliki and George W. Bush had a disagreement on standing forces agreements, right? Yes. That negotiation process, though, most Americans and most of the world never got to see. The Standing Forces Agreement negotiations, we weren't a part of. How hard did the U.S. push for it? We don't know. We know that the Obama administration didn't want to be there and backed out without fighting for a stricter Standard Forces Agreement and left the region in a vacuum and chaos. Okay, you didn't tell the whole story. Okay, first of all, Maliki, his nickname was Stubborn, and he had it from childhood on. Number two, the generals finally convinced uh, uh, Obama to sit down and talk to Maliki, and he did. That's a historical fact that he, his group sat down to talk to Maliki, and Maliki said, yes, we can lead troops in there if, if they fall under Iraqi laws. And none of the generals or Obama would agree to that. That they didn't. If an American soldier killed someone in Iraq, they would go to jail in Iraq, and that wouldn't would not be acceptable. Now, now, Dave, you realize, even after this whole show of withdrawing forces, we still had forces there, right? Right. That were still subject to Iraqi law. No, they weren't until they left. But, but they, they're there now. They, they okay. And okay, then, so then he's going, a hypocrite. If you're going to say that you're going to back out, if they're not going to be subject to Iraqi law, then leaving those guys there and those gals there under Iraqi law, we it's got to be one way or the other. Either you didn't you didn't take everyone out when you said you were, or you left people in subject to those laws. We did remove everyone but a small group that was support, that was uh, guarding our embassy, period. And, the, and then he pumped them back in. Right. Okay. And then, okay, then what happened? <laughs> ISIS blew up, okay? Uh, Maliki and uh, ran down the Syria, the Sunnis. And the, he, uh, and the Sunnis All right, Dave. rebelled. out. Okay. And then obviously, were, obviously, it's a complicated situation, okay. but we have a lot of and, calls. And, right. and, I'm just telling you that, that Maliki finally was forced to let okay. troops back you, in. You have said that. Thank you very yeah. much. And I, we have, we, our, our lines are full. I'm sorry. We're trying to be fair to everybody. So uh, Mike is up next. Mike, you're on Talk well, Back. Yeah, I'll make this quick because I, I went to a country school with no lights, no, no, you know, no electricity, no running water, and a wood dam stove. But if there's one thing I did learn, and one thing that really ticks me off, when, and this with every bastard politician I hear, would you please say this is a republic, not a damn democracy? <laughs> Come on, this is ridiculous. Democracy is the worst form of government you can dream up, other than a dictatorship, and a dictatorship probably is a lot better than a democracy any way you cut it, because it's mob rule. Thanks. That's all I got to Thanks, say on Mike. that project. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Have a good morning. Okay, appreciate the call. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a quick break here. Elena and Bobby are both waiting, and we have two other lines open, 721-1290. Dirk Sandover is going to join us at 9 to talk about the uh, the Montana Supreme Court, and we will be right back. Okay, we're back. 
Talk back, 721-1290 is the number, and we are rapidly running out of time to talk about in this segment. So, And we won't even get to play the audio I have loaded up <laughs> about the Poo-Mobile. <laughs> have you heard about this? Yes. The, so this the, DNC it's, traveling van, right? It's going through Georgia. <laughs> They pull off the side of the road, and they got this bus with, like, Hillary's face and Forward America plastered all over it. Right. They dump all of their refuse right into the middle of the road in front of businesses and shops and everything. Right right into the storm drain. Right into the storm drain. (laughs) Which, by the way, is an ecological hazard, right? Yes, Yes. it certainly is. Anyway. And they got in big trouble. Maybe we'll talk about that tomorrow. But if you uh, think this election stinks... In Georgia, it definitely does. But, but I, I got to tell you, as as a metaphor for the entire political process, I think it's perfect. All right. <clears throat> Elena, you're on Talkback. Hi. Hi. First of all, I want to thank Mike for bringing that point up about a republic. Sure. That always turns me off. As far as, I think it was Dave and about the woman groping, I think nine came forward. and <laughs> Maybe they were forward. And um, six of them have been debunked. The one that he mentioned uh, that was on his on Trump's show has a restaurant. And in April, she invited him to attend her restaurant. Now, to go on to uh, the, first, the first debate that was all the way back in September at Hofstra, and uh, what's his name, Lester Holt was the moderator. This is from the transcript, Holt. One of you will not win the election, so my final question to you tonight, are you willing to accept the outcome as the will of the voters, Secretary Clinton? Clinton, well, (laughs) I support our, here you go, Mike, democracy. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but I certainly will support the outcome of this election. And then she says something else about Donald trying to plant doubt. Holt, will you accept the outcome of the election? This is to Trump. Trump, look, here's the story. I want to make America great again. I'm going to be able to do it. I don't believe Hillary will. The answer is, if she wins, I will absolutely support her. End of quote. Okay. Thank you. Well, there you go. Thanks Thanks for the call. Thanks for bringing that up. All right. We have just a minute and a half left. So, see, Bobby's on line four. Bobby, you're up. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. Do you all remember Rob Lagojevich? He was the oh. governor of Illinois. Oh, yeah. And he is in prison now for 14 years. And the reason he is in prison is he was caught on the phone records of saying that when Obama vacated his Senate seat, that somebody would have to give him something really good. To get that seat, because that seat was gold. Yeah, and that's called pay for play they, they, or quid I, pro quo. I remember they had to bleep out a lot of stuff because he's one of the most yes. foul mouthed people I've ever yes. seen. So yeah. yes, but he's in prison for that. But he's not actually married to a former president or was Secretary of State or had his husband or wife talk in private to the Attorney General of the United States. And the other thing about Maliki and this whole Iraq thing and ISIS is that Maliki, when they were being attacked by ISIS, Maliki was begging Obama, please, just send some drones and help us. Because at the time, ISIS, I think, was somewhere around 10,000 people. But Obama said, and I quote, you're on your own. So you can say whoever created ISIS, even though they were running guns, the U.S. government, to the Secretary of State, to Turkey, into Benghazi, and they were supplying the rebels in Syria, who turned out to be ISIS. You have 10 seconds. Okay, that's it. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Rocky, I'm sorry we couldn't get you on. We're going to transition here, uh, take a quick break for the top of the hour news, and we could talk about the poo later. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Or rehearse the Iraq war again. (laughs) Whatever. Okay. We're going to come right back. Stay with us. Dirk Sandover is going to date's cat. Oh, and and Silway Armory as well. Sorry about that. All right. Welcome back, everybody. That's John King. I'm Peter Christian. And uh, joining us here in studio, although he's been here the whole time, uh, kind of a silent partner, Dirk Sandifer. How are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me here this morning. You bet. Now, you you came all the way to Missoula from where to be be here today? From Great Falls. From Great Falls. Okay. So now for those uh, folks, we had had Kristen Juris on uh, last week, so we thought only fair that you, you should be on as well, running for the Montana Supreme Court. Give us the basics. Give us a little bit about Dirk Sandifer, who you are, where you came from, your background, and why you're running for the Supreme Court. 
Well, in a nutshell, I'm third generation Montanan, born and raised in Great Falls. Came from uh, Montana's working people. My dad was not a body mechanic. My mom worked in a doctor's office. Uh, went to the University of Montana and graduated uh, with a computer science degree in 1985. Promptly went back to Great Falls and put that to work driving a forklift. <laughs> and uh, well, back then the computers were big. You needed a forklift to carry them around, right? Yes, and and they deliver- were big. <laughs> right, exactly. Deli- delivering construction supplies and uh, doing some uh, labor as well. And uh, through a roundabout way, ended up in Haver, Montana, uh, chasing the woman who became my wife, and uh, got a job working as a police officer with the city of Haver. Uh, and uh, was there for three plus years and was introduced to the legal system. And through that uh, experience, went on to law school, graduated uh, from the University of Montana with uh, high honors, uh, third in my class in 1993. Went back to Great Falls, went to work briefly in a private law firm, uh, worked uh, briefly as a contract public defender. I wanted to be a criminal prosecutor. They eventually hired me at the Cascade County Attorney's Office when they got tired of fighting with me. <laughs> and uh, I was there for about uh, eight plus years uh, as a criminal prosecutor. And I also became chief civil legal counsel for Cascade County, which is a multi headed, multi million dollar public corporation with more problems than you can imagine. And uh, then I was elected uh, in Great Falls to an open seat to a new judicial position created by the legislature in 2002. And I've been a state district judge in Great Falls in Cascade County for the last 14 years. I've been elected three times, the last two times unopposed. And uh, in a nutshell, that's uh, who I am, where I came from. I'm running for the Supreme Court because obviously as a district judge, I am very familiar with what the court does. They review the work of our district court judges. I've sat on the court as a substitute justice uh, on a number of occasions at the request of the chief justice. It's very important to maintain the court uh, as a nonpartisan, non-ideological body who decides cases strictly based on facts and law under our state and federal constitution and let the chips fall where they may. And the court races and Uh, The public perception of courts have become increasingly politicized over the years, uh, uh, largely because of what's went on in the federal arena where the court is so political. The Montana Supreme Court, I think, uh, has not been uh, overtly political like the U.S. Supreme Court has been, but it's been criticized at times, uh, sometimes fairly, sometimes not. Would you mind telling me what you think of when you say the court being political, what are you talking about? Are you talking about picking winners and losers or the way they interpret the Constitution or siding with Republicans or Democrats or, or what? Well, political, I guess, is what's in the eye of the beholder. And, and what happens is, uh, start with the federal Supreme Court, because it is political. It's, we don't elect our federal Supreme Court justices and, distri- and, and uh, appellate and district judges, but they are selected by a patently partisan political process, whether the administration is Republican or whether it is Democratic, they go out and they try to select uh, judges uh, to be on the federal Supreme Court uh, who are of uh, like uh, worldview as the administration is. And the bedlam occurs from time to time when uh, some of these uh, Supreme Court justices don't follow type and they're independent, which is actually what they're supposed to do. But then people are are upset about that. But uh, to to get to your question, the the problem is, is this, is that the public, for the most part, looks at judicial decisions based upon whether they like the results or not. And the U.S. Supreme Court, I think, has been fairly criticized over the years for not... uh, deciding these cases based on the constitutional principles and the facts of these cases and not having, or or, or, excuse me, and being free from uh, political or social policy influences. That's where the courts get into problems is when they start to let political ideology or social policy influences uh, influence the legal analysis under the Constitution of these cases. Now, if that's the standard, it seems to me that Montana is a clear case of that coming, going out of hand, where Montana Supreme Court overturns citizens' initiatives pretty regularly that it might, that might one 
for example, to constrain government activity, uh, where it doesn't step in and stop CIs that open up or expand government activity? Well, I think that it depends upon the case. I mean, that may or may not be fair criticism. It depends on the case. You have to look at not uh, the outcome of the case and whether you agreed with whether they found the particular initiative to be uh, valid or not. The, the real test of it and where the rubber meets the road is whether or not their reasons for finding it to be valid or invalid are grounded in law and free of, of political taint. And most of the challenges that come to these initiatives, whether they're initiatives that uh, are viewed as uh, from one side of the political spectrum or the other, aren't about the substance of the initiative itself. It's about whether the, the, the signature process, whether the initiative itself, if it's passed, will conform to the overriding constitutional limitations on the legislative process because people, I think, often forget that although the citizens have broad initiative power in Montana, it's, uh, they're, they're bound by the same uh, limitations that the legislature is. The legislative power is broad in Montana, but it's still governed by uh, overlying constitutional limitations. Okay, we're up against a break. 721-1290 is our number. Dirk Santa for joining us here this morning. A nonpartisan race for uh, for the Montana Supreme Court running against, Christ- against Kristen Juris, who was on with us last week. 721-1290 is our number, and we're going to come right back. All four of our lines are open. You can also make your comments or questions on our Facebook page. We're coming right back. Okay, we are back on Talkback 721-1290 is a number, and uh, we have Dirk Sandifer here in the studio running for the Supreme Court. Let's get Tom on the line. Tom, go ahead. What's on your mind? Thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, Your Honor, I have a question about stream access laws. I was wondering what your opinion is on those and what the difference is, in your opinion, between yourself and your uh, competitor, Ms. Juris. Well, first of all, we have very permissive uh, public stream access laws under our state constitution, our underlying uh, statutory scheme, and uh, interpretive case law of the Montana Supreme Court. And those laws are a result of the will of the people, first in the 1972 constitution and in the legislative uh, enactments uh, prior to that and there under. And, of course, in my view, the court decisions of the Montana Supreme Court are in accord with the will of the people to have uh, very permissive stream access uh, rights here in Montana. The big difference between Ms. Juris and myself, or Professor Juris, to to be respectful to her, is that uh, before she was in the political arena trying to run for the Supreme Court, she had uh, taken very pointed positions of advocacy where she uh, characterized aspects of Montana's permissive stream access laws as, in her words, a monumental erosion of private property rights. And that's caused a great deal of consternation mm-hmm. in the uh, stream access and uh, recreational community Uh, about people having that type of view or bringing that type of view to the court. My view is simply limited to uh, enforcing the Constitution and the laws as written and letting the chips fall where they may. All right. Does that help you, Tom? Yeah. Thanks for the answer. You bet. Thanks for the call. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. Okay. Real quick, because we also had a call from Andy about stream access laws, and I know it's something that's come up many times, so I just wanted to go back and forth with you a little bit more on this. Sure. So, um... If uh, if Miss Juris or Professor Juris was here, um, she would say, you know, despite advocacies in the past for whatever, as a judge, and she said this, Montana's law is settled when it comes to stream access law, and I would support the law as it stands. Do you feel that that is not enough for a judge to say that they will support the law as it stands? Well, frankly, and again, with respect to her, because I don't want to be disrespectful, but we have debated this issue around the state sharply. That's a little bit... Um, disingenuous, frankly, because if you have a particular view about how the law should be, which she does, and she, it's in writing, it's, and she hasn't disavowed that. All she's tried to say is kind of shift the focus away from that and say, well, I said that before, but the law is settled, and I, I will follow the law. But what the concern is out there, and I think it's legitimate, is that she has that particular uh, previously advocated point of view, 
And even the law, the law, for the most part, is pretty static at the moment. The real problem is in individual cases because these cases are constantly and will continue to be litigated in Montana. And, and the issue isn't so much how to, uh, whether the law is sliding or changing. It's, it's the uh, consistent application of the law to the myriad of factual circumstances that arise in these cases. And the concern out there is, I think, that if somebody who is trying to apply the law and its principles to a wide variety of factual circumstances, circumstances uh, doesn't uh, agree that the law is proper in the first place, isn't going to apply it in a fair fashion. Now, that's the concern. My view uh, about it is, 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 is uh, more uh, legalistic theory-based than that. Her legal writings have stated that she thinks that there are still unresolved issues out there about the uh, constitutionality of our laws and whether or not uh, the, our laws as they exist constitute a taking where the government should have to pay private property owners to allow or continue to allow the public stream access that we have. And she has written before she was a judicial candidate that she thinks those are open issues. And I, frankly, am concerned about that, that well, that is, is a it, bias. Well, is it an open issue? Has it been tried in the Supreme Court before? Well, the point that she she took is that, listen, these laws have been never been challenged as a constitutional taking, and she implied in her writings that uh, she thinks that that's a valid issue and that they may be. And Well, it's pretty easy to say yes or no, right? If it hasn't been tried in Montana, then it hasn't been tried. If well, it has, then it has. I, I can't take a position on that. It would be unethical for me to tell you right now uh, whether or not that I think it's a taking or not, because number one, uh, as a matter of professional ethics, that would be me stating an opinion on the law in a case that could come, be, come before the court. And secondly, it would be irresponsible in any event, even if I could state that opinion, because these aren't just purely legal issues in a vacuum. These cases are decided based upon the unique factual circumstances under which the dispute comes to the court. And I think I think a lot of people ha have a misunderstanding about that. They they think of, of of what by the time something gets to the Montana Supreme Court, it's pretty much cut and dried. It's been argued in in court and then in, in any appellate court, and then finally gets to to the Montana Supreme Court. You would think the the issues would be very very cut and dried and and relatively I want to say you use the word easy, but much more clear for the justices to be able to make a decision. Is that not true? I don't think that's true. I think that on occasion, and it depends upon the case, that can be true. But generally, it's not. Because when these cases go to the Montana Supreme Court on review, uh, there are and are varied and uh, diverse questions that are raised about the lower court judgment. Because what people really don't understand a lot of times is the Montana Supreme Court uh, is a secondary and ultimate reviewer of largely of litigated cases from Montana's district courts. So what they're doing is reviewing the correctness legally and uh, under the evidentiary rules for factual questions of uh, decisions that have been made in lower courts. And so when it comes up there, uh, uh, like the constitutional uh, taking issue, that's largely a purely legal question that seemingly on its face would be pretty straightforward. But it's not because, again, the, 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 it turns on the factual issues in the case and uh, uh, the, the impacts uh, on private property rights, the nature of the, of the public right that's at issue, whether they're in conflict, to what extent, and there's, there's a, a lot more that goes on there and than meets the eye. And that's why there are seven of you, right? That's why there are seven, and that's why even when the law is fairly well uh, uh, static or settled, um, these cases push the, the boundaries of the law because the trick on the, in the court system not, isn't not only to define and interpret what the law is, but to ultimately make a decision how it applies to the ever-changing factual circumstances that come in in these cases. Okay, we're going to take a break, and we have Mike in Maryland and two lines open. And uh, Dirk Sandifer is joining us here in studio this morning, run for the Supreme Court, a nonpartisan uh, race. We'll be back with that, with more of that in a moment. Hey, we're back. This is Talk Back. I'm Peter Christian. That's John King. Joining us in studio, we have Dirk Sandifer, 
uh, running for the Montana Supreme Court. And we have all, almost all four. You're almost a rock star. You get all four, you're a rock star. One more, people. One, one more. more. One more is all he needs. <laughs> 721-1290 is the number. Mike is on the line. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I want to ask you two questions here. I was I told John to ask you one. I wasn't even call, but one is why should I vote for you? Because you see, you're a third generation Montanan. What it says to me is I am a third a third generation Montanan. Therefore, I'm smarter than dumb Mike that came from Minnesota. <laughs> Second one is they define a navigable river in this state. I, I think I know the answer, but, but uh, I don't think everybody else does. The case against Minnesotans is pretty clear, isn't it? I, <laughs> well, we've yeah, adjudicated yeah, this before. Okay, yeah, because a guy spent a year out, year, year out here in Montana from Minnesota. There was a guy spent a year out here from Minnesota, and after a year he said, out of hell with these United States, I'm going back to Minnesota. There you go. <laughs> but seriously. Thanks, okay. Mike. Thanks for the laugh. So, so navigable waters, well, if you can define that. Well, first of all, Mike, I, I don't have any... Uh, philosophical or discriminatory uh, bent or view against Minnesotans or anybody else. In, re in regard to your question about why I talk about being a third-generation Montanan, it's superficial information. You, you're you right about that. Uh, it was uh, in response to the question of uh, who are you and where'd you come from and sure. what's your background. So uh, I don't uh, attach any more significance to it than that. As to what is a navigable uh, stream or waterway, uh, th that's a uh, what should be a pretty simple issue of uh, state and federal law, but in practice is not, and uh, it, it uh, it's often in dispute under state and federal law, and it, it's a, a technical discussion that uh, is probably not that interesting, and I probably can't answer <laughs> in the course of a minute, but but uh, it, it uh, that's part of what the battleground is on some of these stream access cases and other cases that aren't just recreational stream access cases. They're about other matters as well. Not only that, uh, but we're getting into wa possible water rights things, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, so one question I really wanted to ask you is, uh, you know, a lot of people don't really understand when they talk to Supreme Courts or hear Supreme Court candidates talk, they don't really know where their decision-making process how it works, the intricacies of it, because it's a really complex system of information you need to know and laws that you've had adjudicated and a witness to. So, you know, we kind of dumb it down to either an originalist, liberal kind of interpretation of the law. So I'm going to kind of dumb it down a little bit to try to get where you kind of sit on the spectrum. But, you know, when it comes to approaches to the text, do you view the style of someone like Antonin Scalia or do you prefer the style of someone like Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Well, I, I don't think I model myself after either of those styles or philosophical approaches. I think, uh, I'll just ask you, or answer your question straight up and tell you how I approach these cases. Whether we're talking about uh, the federal constitution or the Montana constitution or enactments of the Montana legislature, you, it starts and stops with the plain text and plain meaning of the language of the constitutional or statutory language. And if it is clear and unequivocal on its face, then it's the function and duty of the court to apply the clear and unequivocal uh, language and meaning of, of the language to the factual issue uh, in front of you. If, if the language is vague or, ambig uh, or ambiguous, then it's the duty of the court to try to interpret that in accordance with the you know, manifest intent from the uh, express language of the enactment. Uh, and if, sometimes you have to resort to the constitutional history, uh, the legislative history, uh, to discern that. Uh, and, um, and where the court gets into trouble, though, is sometimes is that uh, there are constitutional provisions or legislative enactments that just weren't intended and contemplated to address the particular issue before the court. And when that happens, the court needs to stop. The court just needs to stop and say, listen, this is a legislative or a congressional matter uh, that is beyond the purview of the court. You can't have the court, uh, the, the, the politically charged term is legislating from the bench. I agree with that. The court can't solve every problem that comes into it. We have to, you know, to dumb it down, paint within the lines of the Constitution, which is the will of the people, and, 
and where appropriate, uh, the, the legislative enactments of the Congress and the, and the state legislature. Um, uh, to be fair, too, right, when you're talking about the Supreme Court, the majority of the cases that you will see on the Supreme Court are the ones where the law isn't clear, where there's a conflict, where it's murky, where lower courts weren't able to make an easy decision and had to send it up the way to you. So there is a lot more on that, when, especially in a Supreme Court position, where you're focused on some of the more interpretation than in other courts. Well, that, that's true, and, and, and just so we're clear, and uh, the, 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 the lower courts don't send it up there. What happens is, because I'm a, I'm a lower court judge, sure. is we make decisions, and somebody or uh, everybody Sues it. is oh. upset with you, and they think that you've got it wrong, often for different reasons. And so then they go and, and literally appeal to the higher court, and they say, higher court, uh, Sanford down there, he, he, he doesn't get it. You know, he's, this is wrong, and, and, and they'll both say I'm right for their reason, but wrong, you know. In the other way. Yeah. The other way. And, but and? In, in any event, so what happens, though, is, is that the Supreme Court has to look at that and, and decide that issue. And that's, that's what the function of the court is. And, again, it, it's, it comes back to the Constitution. Uh, it comes back to the legislative enactments. And the, it, it's, it's proper for the court— to try to apply existing constitutional principles and existing legislative principles to the various fact patterns that never could be contemplated as long as that falls within the general language and policy of those constitutional and statutory enactments. That's what courts are supposed to do. Sometimes that's controversial. But what we're not supposed to do is um, uh, imprint our own uh, ideology or social policy uh, or public policy views to try to make law where there isn't already existing law. That's where the problem comes. Take, we're going to take a break. 721-1290 is the number. Marilyn and Catherine are waiting patiently on the line. I'm going to get you guys in just a minute. We have two lines open. Dirk Sander for joining us here in studio. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back on Talkback. 721-1290 is the number. John King's over there. I'm Peter Christian. Joining us in studio, Dirk Sandifer. And I promise we get right back to the phones. Let's do that right now. Marilyn, you're back. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, okay, back to the property rights issue. Political correctness and social engineering has... Um, we've gone down the wrong road, I believe, as far as, you know, government, courts, telling businesses who they have to hire, not hire, and, like, if you're a homeowner and you want to rent out your basement or you're an apartment building owner, who you have to rent to or not rent to, uh, businesses who they have to serve, not serve. Um, I think this is very dangerous, and it's an erosion of our property rights, and I think there's a lot of us out here concerned about where that's been going and is headed. So um, I'd like you to speak more on property rights. Okay, uh, thanks, Marilyn. So are we talking about we're talking about various levels of uh, of jurisdiction, right? Federal, state, local, things like that, right? That's right. And of course, the the preeminent uh, protector and, and provider of uh, and, and governor of those types of issues is the United States Constitution, and uh, constitutional enactments of the Congress enacted thereunder. Uh, the Montana Constitution and the Montana uh, legislative enactments uh, can impose uh, more stringent requirements than minimum federal requirements. Uh, they can legislate uh, and govern areas where the federal constitution does not, but they cannot conflict with the federal uh, constitution and, and, and uh, um, appropriate federal enactments. To Marilyn's question, this is a, a very uh, controversial issue. It's a broad issue, as you present it, but I'll try to address it in, in, in broad terms, is that uh, people are very concerned about these issues. And they're issues of, frankly, of public policy for the, the general electorate, both under our federal and state constitutions and in our legislature. And the role of the court isn't to decide whether... Uh, individual constitutional rights, federal or state, are appropriate or not, because they are the will of the people having been enacted into 
our constitutions and by the Congress and by the legislature, as the case may be, uh, through the, the government process. The court needs to stay out of that. Our job is, is when the people have spoken uh, by constitutional enactment or by constitutional legislative enactment, it's our job to enforce those rights, to enforce those laws, and let the chips fall where they may. And if people and the majority of people in the country or in the state uh, are of a different view, then there are processes to change our constitutions, to influence our legislature or our Congress. And I understand that that's a wieldy process, and it takes a supermajority of people to do that. But that's the idea that we have in this country and in this state to make sure that public policy uh, represents uh, the widest cross-section of, of people um, in, in our communities and in, in our state. Okay, let's get back to the phone. Catherine, thanks for holding. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, this is uh, My question is related to uh, the previous question, I guess, uh, and this is an example that I'm using. Uh, the EPA Clean Water Act is expanding its ruling, uh, this is out of Michigan, that, that uh, furrows in plowed land, for example, constitute many mountains they are being defined as that, uh, mountain ranges. <laughs> and that many mountain ranges, that's how they, they phrase it, yes. Wow. And that puddles that, uh, puddles that accumulate in these furrows uh, are therefore subject to EPA control and oversight. And the EPA is moving forward on this despite a judicial stay on this expansion. So my question is, rulings such as this, uh, does rulings such as this, such as this, trump the Montana Constitution? And if it doesn't, how would the judgment be enforced if the agency refuses to abide by the state law? And the larger question is then the relationship between federal laws that are, or federal regulations that are um, promulgated by unelected agencies, um, how does that interact with state laws and constitutions? Well, generally, Catherine, when uh, state uh, laws, and that includes the full body from constitutional laws to state statutes Thanks, Catherine. state administrative regulations, when they conflict with properly enacted and uh, federally constitutional uh, enactments of the Congress, uh, administrative ele- uh, federal administrative regulations, the federal laws govern over conflicting state laws as a matter of federal supremacy under the federal constitution. There are some uh, it, areas where that's a little more murkier than that, but generally that's the situation. Your situation that you describe of the many mountains and yeah, it sounds ridiculous and probably is. Uh, I, I understand your frustration. I've dealt with that in the, in the state district court uh, when we're dealing with disputes there between um, uh, government regulatory agencies taking unreasonable positions uh, with private people. And uh, that's one of the things that, that uh, I felt good about my career is when I have dealt with those cases and have been able to cut through that uh, in individual cases to find some reasonable application of the law. That's a good thing for everybody. But I, I don't know that I can comment on it much farther than that because I, I just don't know enough about the particular situation you're describing. Hey, we're up against a break. Seven two one twelve ninety. John is waiting very patiently. We have three other lines open. Or if you have a question you want to put on Facebook, we'll be happy to pass it along to Dirk Sandivers, our guest this morning running for the Supreme Court uh, out of Great Falls. And we'll be right back. And we're back. 721-1290 is our number. 1-800-568-5309. John King, Peter Christian, Dirk Santa for joining us here in the studio. Quiz. Okay. Um, yeah, we got a caller, John, in the queue. I want to get to that call. But after that call, I want you to respond to something that a lot of people have noticed about this particular Supreme Court race. And that is that it's a little, as uh, Trump would say, a little nasty. Uh, it's been pretty hard fought, uh, which is a little atypical for Montana Supreme Court races. Um, in fact, you described it to me before the show as a knockout, you know, drag out, knockdown, drag out sort of engagement. And, you know, whether it's um, you being charged with uh, being too favorable to child pornographers or um, being too cozy with trial lawyers or, you know, whatever, there's been a lot of charges that way. And then on the other side, there's charges of uh, your opponent being bigoted when it comes to her approach to the law. 
I guess my question after we talk to John, and I want you to talk about this race, do you think that this is actually the two of you as you are, or is this the money that's pouring into the race and the interest that the Supreme Court race has in Montana? Or are these legitimate issues that are being raised? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second, but I just kind of want to set the stage because I do want to get into that before the show's over. Okay, let's get John on first. Hi, John. What's on your mind? Yeah, thanks for taking my call. I missed the first half hour, so I've got a couple of comments. Hopefully nobody's already pointed them out. Go ahead. First is uh, the, the fairy tale that federal Supreme Court and state Supreme Court judges are nonpartisan is the biggest fairy tale out there. Secondly, uh, if you look at our Montana Supreme Court, they've all, every one of them, were backed by the Montana Trial Lawyers Association, who donate a huge amount of some money to make sure that they got in there. So they're in the pockets of the Montana Trial Lawyers Association. So when I tell people, they ask me who to vote for in the Supreme Court race, I say, do not, do not vote for the person who is being backed by the Montana Trial Lawyers Association. Let me ask you a question, because um, this has come up in the debate. Actually, I just referred to it a few seconds ago. Why is the endorsement of the Montana Trials, uh, Trial Lawyers Association a, a bad thing in your view? Because they spend so because they're the ones that go before the Supreme Court almost all the time here in Montana, and they spend so much money get, making sure each one of those people gets elected that they're they're partisan. There's no doubt about it. If you look at the rulings they've made over the years, of course, not many people pay attention to that. But if you do pay attention to it and you've got half a brain, it's easy to figure out. All right. So what? So what's your question for Dirk? Sandler? I don't have a question. That's just my suggestion. Okay. <laughs> Do not vote for the person that's backed by the Montana Trial Lawyers Association. Okay. Thank, thanks for the call. So. Well, that sets up my question prior as well. So I guess you can go into that. Well, John, I actually thank you for raising those issues with me. I won't purport to try to uh, defend anybody else. All I can do is talk about myself. And th this is the straight. Uh, scoop on this as it relates to me. I've been a district judge in one of Montana's bu busiest judicial districts for the last 14 years. I've got a pr tried and true and proven record of being fair, impartial, and fiercely independent. And unlike my opponent and unlike most people who run for office, every single thing that I've done over the last 14 years has been on the record, either in a written decision and or in a verbatim transcript of what I've done, where I've stated what I've done and why. I would defy anybody to find any hint of partisanship or personal ideology in anything I've ever done. Reasonable people can certainly disagree, and often do, about <laughs> whether or not I was right on a particular situation, but it has nothing to do with partisanship or ideology. This trial lawyer's issue... Oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Um, I can't control what the trial lawyers do, uh, I'm supported by trial lawyers, which so people know is, is in the p political sense, is people who are private uh, lawyers who largely represent plaintiffs in the civil justice system. I'm supported equally by defense trial lawyers uh, who aren't trial lawyers in the vernacular or a reference that you're making. I'm supported by uh, civil practitioners, criminal prosecutors, criminal defense lawyers. I have broad support across the entire legal spectrum of the state of Montana. I'm also happy to tell you and proud to tell you I am supported and endorsed publicly by every single Montana retired Supreme Court justice. These are the people that Montanans have trusted over the last 20 years on our court. They represent a wide variety of legal thinking. They haven't always agreed on much, but they agree that I am the proper and most qualified candidate for this position. Now, your, uh, your opponent in this race, um, uh, Professor Juris, has been advocating herself as an outsider of sorts, a different view on the court, pre presenting different uh, opinions and positions with experience and in, in aspects of law that the rest of the court just doesn't have. I would like you to kind of address that argument that, when, that when she we come, made. When we come back from the break. <laughs> okay, we, have one, we have a one-minute timeout, and we also have he uh, Henry and Kevin want to visit with you. We'll try to get them all in in the next eight and a half minutes, and we'll be right back. Okay, we're back. Just a few minutes left in the program now, John. You were bringing up something with yeah, Dirk I just wanted a second to, ago. Yeah. You know, they're, they're both candidates have people supporting them and endorsing them from different fields and different, you know, you know, sides of the fence. But the, basically, I mean, the the two have kind of uh, Mr. Um, Sandifer has kind of promoted himself as being a, a guy with a lot of experience, backed by people in the judicial field, whether that be the trial lawyers or the defense attorneys, et cetera. 
And then your opponent has been advocating herself as someone who has an outsider's viewpoint, would be a more diversified court if she was elected, that she would offer experience that the court doesn't have in very difficult aspects of law. And I guess I wanted to get you to kind of t- to take that kind of dialogue and, and run with it for a second. Well, first of all, again, with respect to Professor Juris, she's trying to sell herself as somebody who having unique and diverse experience that's not currently represented on the court. And that's just wrong for a number of reasons. Number of reasons. Number one, she's not uh, any doesn't have any particular expertise uh, that she purports to have. She has uh, been a transactional lawyer prior to the last 16 years and has been a law professor. She's been involved in various issues. She's a smart person and she has some expertise. Bottom line is this. What she's saying is what you say when you don't have broad-based proven experience like I have. The case is, and the uh, experience areas that she has, those cases uh, come into Montana's district courts. Those are the very cases I've been deciding for the last 16 years. So even to the extent that it's, that uh, she has experience in those areas, she hasn't been representing Montanans in court on those, uh, on those issues. She certainly hasn't been a judge. I've been deciding those cases. I'm the one between the two of us who has experience handling those types of cases in our court system. Okay, let's get back to the phone and say good morning to Henry. Hi, Henry. You're on with Dirk Sandover. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, I know you're not allowed or you won't answer questions that are too hypothetical, but uh, let's just assume that Missoula passes a law that says nobody is allowed uh, on the streets after 7 o'clock at night if they have red hair. Um, Pretty simple on that one. You could probably give me an answer on that one. Is that correct? I can give you an answer on that one because that one is a completely arbitrary uh, distinction and, and it certainly just wouldn't be enforced. But what if they were from Minnesota? <laughs> that would be totally yeah. fair, right? Well, no, that's another matter because that's a more distinguishing discrimination. Okay. I'm just now, joking next, next for question, Minnesotans I, I, out there. I that, was, that was meant to be pretty silly, but the next question is Missoula City Council passes a law that says you have to have a federal background check to buy a firearm in the city of Missoula, within the city limits. And uh, maybe you can't give us a definitive answer right now, but maybe you could give us an idea of which way you're going to go on something like that. Well, I I can't tell you which way I'm going to go on that because, first of all, it would be unethical. But secondly, I don't know. It would depend upon the case. What I can tell you about uh, the, the, the gun rights issue is the Second Amendment uh, is very uh, explicit. It's very strong. It's very well developed in our law. I personally am a gun guy. I've, be, I've been a police officer. I've carried a gun for a living. I have a carried conce- concealed carry. Uh, I'm comfortable with guns. I'm like most Montanans. Uh, we cling tightly to the gun rights that we have. All right. Thanks okay. for your call. Appreciate the call, Henry. All right. Let's get Kevin on the line. Hi, Kevin. Uh, yeah, I wanted to revisit the question that Catherine asked you because maybe you didn't quite understand what she was asking. And I'm not so sure I have it right either. But what I believe she was asking was when you have an EPA, a government agency, going into a community and reinterpreting what they say would be law that possibly could be uh, pushed for the Congress, is, uh, does that trump state law, even though Congress did not authorize it? Well, that's often the dispute is... Uh, when you're looking at these in the uh, from a legal standpoint, is one, the first question is, is, it, is this um, administrative regulation, federal or state, actually authorized within the scope of the rulemaking authority uh, delegated to the administrative agency by the Congress uh, or the state government, as the case may be? You get to that issue, if they're acting within the scope of their authority, uh, then you go from there. If there are conflicts between the EPA acting within the scope of its legal authority under the federal constitution and federal statute and state law, generally the federal law uh, controls. Um, yeah, and, and these would not be cases you would adjudicate. Likely they would go to a, a Ninth Circuit Court and then to the Supreme Court, right? Not necessarily, because uh, the state court system... Uh, also deals uh, with the enforcement uh, and interpretation of federal law in many circumstances. There is some overlap there. Okay. Well, hey, thanks for your call. I have one more question. Real real quick, we have... Missoula, in the Montana Supreme Court, uh, said it was okay for the city to confiscate private property. 
Uh, you're mountain obviously mountain water case. Is yeah. that what you're talking mountain about? Mountain water. Right. Obviously, you're going to be if, if you're elected a Supreme Court justice. How would you have uh, uh, reviewed that? Okay. Thanks for the call. Well, the the general parameters there is is that uh, th- there's a power of eminent domain with a the government uh, under the uh, state statutes in Montana has the power, which is provided by the legislature to appropriate private property under the law, and it's a little more complicated than this, but basically if you can show a sufficient public need for it, and then if they can get over that hump that this is really a truly public purpose, then uh, the private property owner has to be adequately compensated. Now, that was what was at issue in the Missoula water situation. And it's, again, I'm dumbing this down to very superficial points. We have less uh, about a minute. But so. the question of whether there truly was a public need uh, as opposed to allowing private uh, industry uh, or sector deal with this. And then secondly, what's the appropriate compensation level? It's a very complex question. It's controversial here in Montana. And it was a split decision. And, and uh, uh, those are often the type of things that are disputed. Right. Well, th- hey, thanks so much for your time. Uh, thank you, by the way. Uh, you, you don't know it yet, audience, but Peter and I are raising money for Big Brothers Big Sisters. Yes, and yes, yes. Judge Sandifer did uh, give us a $100 donation. By the way, we would love your help, too. If you want to try to up Mr. Sandifer's <laughs> offer, give us a call after the show at 721-1290. So far, he's the leading donator, even yeah. more than our general manager, for crying yeah, out loud. Yeah, for heaven's sake. So, okay. uh, uh, yeah, give us a call, 721-1290. We'll put you on the list. It was list. a pleasure meeting you, sir. Thank you, guys. This has been great, and thank you to the audience. You bet. And uh, that's going to do it for today. So, John, uh, tomorrow's Friday, of course. Yeah, Rachel Forte is actually going to swing by for a little bit. Yeah, We'd love okay. Governor Bullock to swing by, too. Absolutely. Well, have a it's great day, a plane everybody. right away. Bye-bye.